This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, so what I'd like to do this afternoon is go through the topics as listed. First, uh, knowing that it's a fairly broad audience, I want to bring you up to date on what about the cut flower industry as it exists here in North America, South America, perhaps a little in Europe, uh, and then narrow down to the North American and the state uh, situation uh, to get a perhaps a little better understanding what uh, the industry consists of. And then uh, the, the area of support for that industry is fairly unique, so I wanted to uh, present you some uh, information on that, both on the extension side as well as the research side, but on the research side, I'm going to mostly be talking about uh, the fun I'm having with cut flowers or have had for the last dozen years or so. Uh, that's not to say there isn't research going on elsewhere, but uh, I'm just kind of selfish in that regard. So uh, when I lecture, I like to have an open mic so everyone uh, can participate. If there are things that aren't clear or if you'd like to add something, feel free to pipe up. I'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, the States uh, doesn't produce much in the way of cut flowers. We rely on primarily South America for the cut flowers that we buy because we want to buy them year round. To have Valentine's Day without roses would be unheard of. To produce roses at that time of year here is prohibitively expensive and probably consumers wouldn't stand for it. But we have a very lively process of importation of especially roses, but also chrysanthemums, uh, carnations, and alstroemeria from South America, especially Colombia, where they can grow year round. The labor is cheap, the transportation costs are minimal. And so as a result of that, our domestic production of those four commodities is, is really very small. So we do produce cut flowers here, and some of them are listed in the lower part of the table, uh, and increasing percentages as you go down of gladioli, irises, lilies, tulips are about half and half coming from other places. And even those tulips that we do grow here the bulbs are not being produced here. They're coming from Holland primarily, uh, Chile sometimes. Uh, so it's not really a wholly domestic industry. I guess I shouldn't wander around too much that I could further the slide. So the, the South America con uh, uh, aspect is highland valleys near the equator, temperature the same year round, no photoperiod problems. And so uh, they grow them under cover. As you can see for the mums here and these structures here that looks like there might be carnations underneath. So some of the high tunnels that they have there are very extensive. Some are modern, some are more traditional. Protection from rain is primarily what they want them for because the temperature regulation is not ne necessary. So that's how a bulk of flowers are produced. Uh, that end up in our market. The point about those flowers, yes, some of them I identified and the USDA keeps track of how many uh, stems are being produced and what the value is and so on. But a lot of others, like uh, sunflowers for instance, which are a real big deal, uh, they aren't keeping track of those. Uh, dahlias is another one which is not uh, accounted for. Chris, why are those not counted by uh, you need to ask the USDA. I think they lump them under others. Hmm. And so it, uh, it's an incomplete record. Uh, but the quantities in comparison to roses are sufficiently low that uh, they, they, there are too many uh, different species, I think, is what, what's happening there. Uh, so there are snapdragons, delphiniums, uh, lysianthus, which we'll be talking about to some extent. Uh, Suffice to say that there are a bunch of different flowers, each with their cultural practice requirements, post-harvest characteristics, vase life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so it gets to be a fairly complicated subject, and one that doesn't lend itself readily to extension. So 
large scale production in the US of cut flowers is primarily on the west coast because of their more favorable climatic conditions than we have here. Uh, this is uh, Washington, Oregon, toward the coast, uh, cool, uh, somewhat cloudy mornings, then the sun comes out and the rest of the day is fine. Uh, a very regular climate uh, which allows a lot of different species to be grown. Hydrangea here, calla lilies in this particular uh, part of the picture. Uh, some other examples, uh, a greenhouse production of Gerberas uh, in uh, the Watsonville area uh, of Central California, uh, large scale, mostly under glass. Uh, tulip production, in this case in a factory uh, type of situation in Virginia. And again, like I mentioned, uh, this is uh, production using bulbs from Holland for some parts of the year. And then other parts of the year when Holland can't supply, they're getting them from Chile. And they're able to keep producing, in some cases hydroponically, in some cases uh, just in mix, uh, for 10 out of 12 months. This time of year it's too hot in the greenhouse, so th uh, they, they do a poor job of it. But the rest of the time, and if you go down to Wegmans or other stores, these would be the tulips you'll be getting. Okay? It doesn't say so, but uh, this is a big, big outfit, and there are one or two others that do a similar uh, sort of uh, uh, production. Then other parts of California are growing hypericum over there on the right, uh, looks like stock in the right, uh, and uh, scabiosa. So lots of different flowers, large scale, but mostly going to a wholesale uh, kind of uh, marketing system. When we come closer here uh, to the Northeast and New York State more specifically, then uh, there are some large scale producers and they tend to go into the wholesale uh, primarily. We have in fact the picture on your upper right uh, is one of the large scale peony farms uh, that's existing just north of uh, the experiment station in Geneva and there's a second peony grower in that same vicinity. Uh, this particular one uh, has a farm in Geneva, he has a farm in uh, Pennsylvania, and a couple of farms in Maryland, and he starts harvesting in Maryland and then works his way up so that the relatively narrow harvesting period uh, for peony uh, is extended over that, that uh, four times harvest season. Uh, these are some pictures from Long Island, Dahlia's uh, and Cleome. Uh, again, larger scale production close to the place where uh, those flowers would be in demand. Uh, by far the largest number of producers are in fact small scale. Not only here, but scattered over the United States. And again, this has implications as far as extension is concerned, because you're not talking to three or four big people, you're talking to folks that are doing it part time, small scale and growing a number of different uh, species. In fact, if you look up uh, uh, the book or count the number of species listed uh, in what we would consider the Bible of cut flower production uh, uh, that Armitage and Lauschmann put together, uh, you come up with 83 species. And there are more besides that. Uh, but uh, so there are a number of, uh, of annuals, perennials, woody species, geophytes meaning uh, bulbs, and then you're using in many cases flowers, but could be foliage, could be the fruit, uh, sticks, and these sorts of things. You can look at these later uh, in the talk uh, to see what specific ones we're talking about. Uh, they're mostly locally marketed. It avoids the big four, roses, carnations, mums, alstroemeria, because they can't compete. Uh, and then but the emphasis is freshly produced, hasn't been shipped, will last longer in the vase. And that's the advantage uh, that uh, the local producers have. And some just pictures of those small scale farms, a couple of them from within Tompkins County here. Um, lots of flowers. Uh, and any of you who have gone to the Ithaca Farmers Market know that there are two very good uh, 
producers uh, of, uh, of cut flowers that market there. So farmers markets are a favorite uh, place to uh, sell the flowers that they produce. You find them in supermarkets as well. Uh, weddings and events. Actually, the wedding trade has become quite important for the local producers. If they're able to deal with the, the wives, uh, or sorry, the, the mother-in-laws that uh, are very fussy about what color and size, etc., of flowers they want, uh, the growers that can manage that at the same time as they're producing their, their crop, uh, they can succeed very well and the prices are, are very good. And, and that's, I think, in the recent years has been a shift from going to the florist to get the flowers to going to the producers themselves and specifying, I'm going to get married in three months, I need this color, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, can be a little cheaper, but not an awful lot. Uh, but that's become a quite important one. Uh, there is some roadside trade, as is shown here from a, a picture on Long Island, uh, but that's relatively minor. And then bouquet subscriptions so that uh, a restaurant, say, uh, gets a bouquet or, or 10 bouquets to put on the tables in that restaurant uh, once a week or something like that. And Chris, are moral CSAs becoming more common? Oftentimes a regular CSA, community <coughs> supported agriculture farm that allows people to pick or gets a share of the product, if they go to the farm themselves, there are often are picking gardens where they can mm. cut zinnias, sunflowers, gladioli, and things like that. Yeah, so in, in some cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, as I hinted all along, the information f on cut flowers uh, is difficult to, uh, because there are so many species and because there are so many producers and there are relatively few uh, organizations that can cater to that. So Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, is what we go to for information. If you ask them for information on cut flowers, you don't find very much. And I think what has happened is that uh, they have ceded the field to this organization here, the Associ Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers which is a national, in fact, even international organization based in Ohio, uh, run by an executive uh, uh, director and one or two staff, uh, was founded about 25 years ago, and they have a number of services that cater very well to these uh, diverse uh, people that are growing a number of different crops. Uh, they publish a quarterly magazine on some uh, folks in this room, including Bill, myself, etc., cetera, uh, have written articles uh, about some of the research that's going on in cut flower work uh, as part of that. Uh, they have regional meetings and annual meetings, depending on the year, uh, dotted all over the U.S. and Canada as well. So those can be quite important, but what's even more important is a listserv and that's really the extension service that, that, that provides information. And it's essentially growers helping other growers. Because there are so many different species, you type in there and say, hey, uh, I need some information on this Lesianthus variety. Within a day, someone else said, oh yeah, I tried that one, stinks. <laughs> So that's the end of that, right? Uh, or there could be long discussions about some topic about bed shapers or uh, ways of planting uh, seedlings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's amazing. There are some of the older members who are part of this organization who have been very participatory and have provided tremendous help to new people. Now, it's not for free. The organization, although it's nonprofit, it does require about two hundred dollars a year for people to, to belong to that. But if you as a grower uh, find some information that helps you market your flowers more effectively, that $200 is paid back in that one message that, that you got. So it has succeeded very well and, and is thriving, as I'll show you in a minute. Then they also run a, a coordinated 
a coordinated variety trial. And growers who would like to participate are sent six packets of zinnia varieties, new varieties that the seed companies want to try, uh, test out in the field. And at the end of the year, these growers then have to write and say, yeah, this one went fine, and the stem length was this, and the diameter was that, and it lasted quite a while, and I liked it, but this other one I wouldn't grow again. And then the quarterly magazine, in the January issue, has all these reports in summarized, and it's a, a very valuable piece of information. Then they have a small research foundation which uh, ga gathers money to give out as research grants so that institutions like Cornell uh, could do small trials that help to uh, explore particular things. Then there's quite a bit of post-harvest work going on at uh, North Carolina State University, John Dole runs a yearly program of testing all the new varieties to see how long they last in the vase with different additions and so on. So this is a very valuable organization that if you're at all interested in, uh, in cut flowers, this is the place to go. And with the uh, uh, current popularity of going local and doing it yourself, you can see the membership numbers going up from around 500 or so in 2008 and you know 2015 and it's climbing so the organization has become very popular and it's been a key to the growth of that industry and uh, they have perhaps some interesting challenges ahead on what should be done uh, in the future to keep up with the demand for information okay so research there's Post-harvest research is one of the most important things, and John Dole uh, at NC State, as I just mentioned, uh, is the foremost uh, scientist studying this, uh, this area, uh, trying to see how long can we keep flowers alive of particular varieties. Should we be putting them in water? Should we be putting them in some kind of flower solution, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's his field, and I've had much more fun with doing other things, not very complicated things, and I want to tell you a bit about that research. Uh, one that we're just concluding now for the second year is a chance observation that uh, snapdragons are fairly hardy. And even in our winters here, we can have a situation where they kind of struggle back in the second year after you've grown them in, uh, in the first year. And so we had a variety trial in, the, uh, in our high tunnel. Uh, does everyone understand high tunnel? What I mean is uh, essentially a greenhouse that doesn't have heat and we're, we're producing the crop in the ground, not in containers. Uh, so they're up to them. Uh, and we keep it covered during the winter, so there is some protection going on in that situation. So these are experiments that we have been doing in the high tunnel situation, and in this case also com uh, comparing with growth in the field. And so we did a series of planting dates, trying to see how pr can we uh, produce uh, this crop, and because we can extend the season earlier with a tunnel, we were able to sow the seed on, uh, in mid-February uh, and we were harvesting by the 31st of May. With the field planting, we came in a couple of weeks later or a week later. Uh, then a, a second tunnel planting came in about uh, mid-September. The yields in the first three were quite good. The last one didn't really have enough time. Uh, so we followed up on this work a couple of years ago. We had a variety trial in the high tunnel where we were looking at just performance of the varieties. Uh, and then at the end of that fall season, the plants looked so good, I thought, well, let's just see if they can survive over the winter. And lo and behold, some of them did quite well and came back, and we harvested the second crop. So you can see the yields here, and this is yield per unit area. Uh, for the first one, Chantilly, 
the yield went down a little bit. The next one did fine in the fall, but then it was mostly winter killed. There wasn't anything left, nothing came back. So the yield was essentially fall and that's it. So this was uh, a problem of winter damage. Now we didn't do anything extra. We didn't put any extra protection on these. They were just surviving uh, or not as the case may be. And you can look down the rest of the list and see that some did fine. And some of them, this uh, Potomac lavender, in fact, gave higher yields in the spring than it did in the fall before. But it showed that, yes, you can overwinter this crop, and that might be something that a grower in our region would do. So we followed up on that this past year with a more regular experiment where we, again, sowed the seed in the fall and, or sorry, in the summer for the fall harvest and then kept the plants over until the spring, but protected them in different ways. And that result uh, showed, first of all, that again, we could see varietal differences in winter survival, but we also could make quite a bit of difference in winter survival by keeping a low tunnel over the plants themselves. So we harvested the fall crop, there wasn't much left above ground, but then put a low tunnel over, uh, over that. And then in the spring, as it started coming up, we kept the p tunnel in place until they started to, to shoot up. And lo and behold, with that low tunnel protection, we got quite a nice yield uh, in the spring. So a combination of having the right variety and uh, f protection actually gets you around 40 stems per square foot which on a nine by nine inch spacing is not too shabby, I think. In fact, we stopped harvesting this experiment. We got sick of it and we had so many other things that we were doing in the spring that they kept on growing and, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, we could have gotten more stems off this thing but uh, decided to stop. So is that yep. and antritum not a true annual? Uh, it's really hard to define annual, I think, <laughs> in this situation. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it depends what kind of winters you have. Yeah. Uh, I think in a zone seven, it's probably a perennial, uh, unless it's taken out by some disease or something right. like that. Yeah. Okay, so the next topic. So that essentially the w that work points to the fact that we can, in fact, use that structure, the high unheated uh, greenhouse, uh, as a way of perhaps having perennials that wouldn't make it outside uh, do so uh, uh, in, with the help of that structure and maybe something more than that. And so we've had uh, a bit of experimentation with Eucomus, the pineapple lily, uh, Bill is, uh, Miller and his students have done much more in that regard, but uh, we've successfully overwintered this, which outside, well, Bill can do it, but I haven't been able to <laughs> keep uh, Eucomus lily alive over the, uh, over the, the uh, winter. Uh, but that's one that certainly can be experimented with. Agapanthus is a, is a beautiful flower and I'd love to get uh, some research going on that, but I'm running out of time to do it. <laughs> so I'm passing the torch. <laughs> and then the other one, Alstromeria. Uh, Dr. Mark Bridgen, the uh, director of the Long Island Station, is an Alstromeria breeder. And he has developed some varieties of Alstromeria that will do quite fine uh, in the field. but. In the tunnel environment, where the stems get longer, we might be able to really revolutionize that crop and use it uh, here instead of importing it from Colombia. <laughs> so, so there's work to be done, I think, that uh, might be quite interesting. Another simple uh, problem and simple technique is sort of generally I like to see as many stems as possible per unit area harvested for these cut flowers. And so what I'd like to uh, be able to do uh, is manipulate the plants to become more productive. And in many cases, fine, you can just plant them closer together and they all produce more stems. But plants are expensive and are there other ways we can do this? 
Well, uh, horticulturists and gardeners have known for centuries that if you pinch out the top of the plant when it's still in its vegetative stage, you force branches from, from the base. So here we've been doing this with uh, several species, but here's sunflower. It producing about six leaves, out comes the growing point, and what you end up with then is one, two, three branches where <coughs> the growing point was before. And these can get quite tall, and suddenly you have a yield three times of what you had before. It's not too bad. So we've done a fair amount of work in this, especially with sunflowers, but also with other species, and I wanted to show you some of that. Um, flowers, when you do that, instead of having one stem per unit area, you have three. So they have to somehow manage in that smaller amount of space per stem. And so what happens is the stems are thinner and the flowers are smaller. Here's a comparison. This is the control which has not been pinched. Here it is after pinching. So they're smaller. Well, there's a market for those. And uh, you do get uh, quite a nice increase in yield. There's a comparison. You can see the back of that picture. The ones that haven't been pinched, these have. So they're delayed a little bit in flowering, five, six, seven days, but the yield is increased. And if you look at the, uh, a typical experiment, this one from 19, or sorry, 2007, our stem numbers are increased. The days to flower are delayed a little bit. The stem length is reduced for individual stem, but 60 centimeters for a stem. If you had a meter long, you're going to put that in a vase, it'd be way up here. So you really only need 50 or 60 centimeters, so it's not a big deal. Uh, and the flower diameter, as I showed in the previous picture, is also reduced. So that's feasible, and it's something that can be easily done. Uh, but as I mentioned, you do sacrifice flower, uh, flower size, and that can become a constraint if you overdo it. So we've been doing experiments along this line for some time and using different spacings, <coughs> 6 by 6 inches, 9 by 9 inches, 12 by 12 inches. And as you see, as you crowd the plants closer and you pinch them, you see the flowers get pretty small. And you get to a point where, yeah, I don't like that. It's too small. And there are abnormalities that come in, uh, misshapen, these sorts of things. So the market determines then what you can get away with and what you can still sell. And if you uh, express it in terms of stem yield per unit area, the more you squeeze over to the right, the more you curve this thing down. And if the market says, well, the minimum size that I will accept is around 1.5 inches, then you better not go any higher than 6,000 stems per square thousand square feet. So it's that kind of relationship. Within this, of course, you will have differences between varieties. So the Procut Amber Glow, that uh, inverted triangle, is one that has a larger flower to start with. So you squeeze it, it also reduces in size, but that line is above the line of the other two varieties that have smaller flowers. So this relationship is something that can be quite useful and might, uh, might be a good guide. OK, so we're into pinching. Let's pinch something else. Uh, Lysianthus, beautiful flower, looks like a rose, uh, lasts a long time in the vase. You'll, uh, in the vase back in the corner over there, when you have some more snacks, you'll be able to take a closer look. Um, now, this plant produces several stems per plant, unlike the sunflower, you're already starting with several. And if you pinch it early, it will produce branches, but your increase in yield is going to be less than what you'd, than you'd get with a single stem sunflower. But you still, again, by manipulating the, the spacing, the amount of area per plant, you can again increase productivity fairly, uh, fair, fair, a fair amount. Again, these are experiments that we're doing again this year. This is last year. 
with using two spacings, six by six and nine by nine, pinching or not. Our stem length, interestingly enough, at least at the closest spacing, actually increases. And what's happening here is that the stems are closer together, so they're stretching for the light and they're, they're actually getting longer. But look at the yield. Per square foot, 15 against 11, or the way we are, had been growing it before, we're only getting maybe nine or so. And the flowering dates are delayed a little bit by pinching, but not all that much. So a combination of close spacing and pinching is actually giving us quite a nice increase in yield. And here are some pictures of that. Unfortunately, this is a six by six, this is a nine by nine that hasn't been pinched. And the same variety, six by six, nine by nine with pinching, you see this stretching out. Uh, this is cheating a little bit. This whole thing should be shifted up uh, so it isn't showing, uh, isn't uh, giving the whole truth, but you'll have to trust me on that. Okay, second last topic. Uh, sunflowers may or may not react to day length. Uh, depends on the variety and it, in many cases, if you're just producing sunflowers during the summer, it doesn't really matter. And the sensitivity to this day length is happening in the first three weeks after emergence. After that, the flower has either already formed or will be somewhat delayed depending on the reaction. Uh, the, so we found in screening that some are what we would call facultative short day plants. That means that even if the day length is long, they will eventually come to flower. Uh, or they're day neutral. And then we found a few that are actually contrary. They do it the other way. They're delayed by short days, but not by long days. So we, we've uh, worked with a, a uh, screening test which allows us to grow the plants in the greenhouse under controlled day length conditions for the first three weeks. And then we transplant them to the field and then measure what happens. And the result you can see here. With some varieties, it's quite drastic in fact. If you have one that's sensitive and give it short days, it stays small, it flowers three weeks earlier. And then the one that's growing under long days. And some other characteristics change as well. If you look at it closely, and one of the varieties that is most sensitive is actually this industry standard here in upstate New York, uh, a variety called sun rich orange. Under short day conditions, it develops these ugly little side plants. It's like super flowering. Uh, whereas under long day conditions, it behaves itself and looks just like you'd expect of a variety. There's a close-up of the budding uh, over there on the right. So it's important to know whether a, a variety is going to react that way or not. And here are some other characteristics then. Uh, if you take the short day sensitive variety, and this is a test that we did in, in 2014 of newer varieties, under short day conditions, it flowered in 50 days, took almost 70 days under long day conditions. Right? So the plants were, were speeded up quite a lot. And as a result, the plants were small and the flower diameter was small as well. For the day neutrals, not much difference between the two treatments. And the long day is reversed to some extent. Flowers delayed uh, under short day conditions, not so much uh, under long day et cetera, et cetera. So it, it can make quite a bit of difference and it will make difference for people who are using high tunnels to grow an early crop of sunflowers because they're putting them in when March, April, when the day length is, is still short. And so they're triggered and you get early flowering, that's great, but plants are like this and the plants are ugly, so you can't market them. So it's important to know. Or if you're growing in Florida or uh, uh, South Carolina or someplace, then again, you want to know 
uh, whether the plants are sensitive or not. Last topic, uh, Rudbeckia. I don't have an example. We aren't growing them this year, uh, but very showy flowers. I'll show you some pictures a little later on. Uh, and uh, we're finding, this is back 2005, uh, that uh, the later you go in the season, you plant them in the spring, and they have very nice stems, and they're beautiful, and so on. But they keep flowering all summer long, which is nice but the stem lengths get shorter and shorter and shorter. You say, Wait a minute, what's going on here? Does it need fertilizer or what's going on? And then we decided to look in the literature and found out that it is an obligate long day plant. But the way it reacts to the day length requirement is not that it stops flowering, it sort of gradually gets shorter. <laughs> it's as if the stem length is dictated by the day length under which the, that flower is developing. So we did some experiments with shading, trying to lengthen the stems and this kind of thing. Didn't really make any difference, and you just have these parallel lines all going down into the basement. Uh, so what to do? How can we keep stems long? So we decided to innovate. Uh, we had to do it economically, so have to come up with instruments that can do this for us without having to pay NYSEG all sorts of fees. Because, I mean, if you turn a flower field into a used car park, you do have electric bills that you might not be able to really justify for a crop like, like uh, uh, Rudbeckia here. And so one thing that we used is a, uh, a light that shines down on the plant, and it has a solar cell above. It's like things that you see on sidewalks and things like that. I say, hey, that works pretty good except that the amount of light it, sh it throws is relatively small and is focused. And the plants over here didn't get the signal, so they're still as short as anything. And in order to do the whole bed, you'd spend a fortune on, <laughs> on light, so that didn't work. Then we got even more innovative, decided, oh, the way we can do this is use Christmas lights, right? And so, again, solar powered. You can get these uh, from Amazon, no sweat. And so there, there you see the black string there, and you see the light shining down, and you see the plant saying, meh. <laughs> it's not enough light. It really, so, so innovation didn't work in this case. And so we decided we ne needed to really do a little science in this and figure out, well, how much light does it actually need in order to trigger the photoperiod response? Well, we have this uh, very nice, uh, a greenhouse set up at Guterman that we were using for the photoperiod reaction of sunflowers that I mentioned before. So we, we can put curtains over the top and just say, okay, the day length is when the curtains close, there's no more light. And so we used that and closed the curtains at 12 hours. See, the curtain goes uh, this way. But then at the end, we put in these lights that kept the day length at 16 hours, so the long day. And when you do that, and you only put lights at one end, then only the plants that are actually sensing the light will flower or have some kind of stem length, and the others won't. And so, very nice, the ones close to the light are flowering and looking very happy, and these guys down here are producing spinach, but who wants to eat Rudbeckia spinach? Uh, and, and from that, then we can get an, uh, a, a test of how much light you really need. And the height of the flowers related to the day length extension, the intensity of light of the day length extension, shows that it's about three micromoles per square meter that's needed. And so it does really require the light equivalent to what you'd have in a used car lot. So, sorry, we aren't going to be able to do that. So what to do instead? Well, I think uh, what we have to go back to is the germplasm of Rudbeckia and try to find varieties of Rudbeckia that are day neutral like some of the sunflower varieties that we were working with before. Now, I'm not a breeder and I run out of time, but if somebody looks looking for a thesis project, come and talk to me. We'll be happy to put you to work. 
So, but if you take a variety like Indian Summer, which is a very popular variety, under 12 hours, no flowers, under 16 hours, is doing what it should. Okay. So, it's time for me to finish. And so I'd like to conclude is first of all to summarize that in the cut flower industry, local cut flower industry in the northeastern United States, in the, in the states in general, uh, is increasingly producing uh, products that people want and producing income for those people that are growing the flowers. And it's an important one which I think really does require uh, quite a bit of backstopping uh, as they help themselves as well. And the Association of Specially Cut Flower Growers is that organization that's helping them quite a lot. Uh, supplying them with research uh, is something that I've had the privilege to do and have enjoyed very much, and that has gotten into some extension work as well. Now, uh, I should have spent about half an hour thanking people, some of you in the room, many of you in the room, and many others in the department uh, now section uh, and others who have been instrumental in uh, helping me uh, work in this field and, uh, and, and getting the job done. The two that I want to mention that are sitting in the front here uh, are Priscilla and Emily, uh, who have put in long hours this year. Somehow, and after all the years of research, I haven't, still, haven't been able to figure out how to grow only a few crops. I always say, oh man, this looks good. Let me put in a variety trial of that. And, and they have been the, the suffering uh, uh, beasts of burden that, uh, and have, in fact, spent time to get them all harvested and measured and things like that. So I do appreciate that and thank you very much for that. Uh, the farm managers, the greenhouse managers, all their staff have been essential in this work as well. Uh, many people in the department uh, I really thank everyone very, very much. And I uh, especially want to also uh, mention Bill Miller and Neil Matson, who have had the privilege to work with on some of this work. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, has really helped uh, a tremendous, tremendous amount. So thanks, everyone. If there are questions, <laughs> and if there's time. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.